Energy media readers will know that we've been covering the Alberta oil sands for a long time. And recently, we've taken an editorial position that it's time to begin talking about transitioning the oil sands and its bitumen product from producing feedstock for refineries to make fuel like diesel and gasoline to making feedstock for materials manufacturing, perhaps carbon fiber, which is what the uh, Alberta Innovates Agency is currently working on. Well, today I'm going to be talking to Warren Chung. Now, he's a professional engineer and president of Well Resources Inc., which is located in Calgary, and they have, uh, that company has developed a process to remove the asphaltines and bottom of the bitumen barrel, and it'll become clear to you how that all fits into what I just talked about and why it's really, really important to the future of the oil sand. So welcome to the interview, Warren. Thanks for having me. Look, uh, this is, in all the work that we've done over the years on the oil sands, we've never really talked in depth about what goes on in a refinery, how a barrel of oil is processed, and how a heavy barrel of oil, or ultra-heavy barrel of oil in this case, is uh, what's different about it and how it's uh, processed differently and why that's important. So uh, let's, first of all, I want to ask you, can you give us a brief description of your company and what it, and you know, what your process is. Absolutely. So uh, Well Resources is a boutique Canadian technology company that has been in operation since 2006. Our company is focused on clean, green, and safe technology development, all the way up to commercialization and subsequent process licensing. All of our work is driven by our underlying philosophy of starting with the science and ultimately driving positive change with regard to effective resource utilization. Effective res resource utilization is our mantra at our company. Uh, this leads to most of our work in the petroleum sector being geared towards the use of traditional refinery waste streams. And under our umbrella, we currently license two commercially proven technologies, uh, which are used in roughly one dozen installations in, across Asia. One of these technologies being our Selects platform, or selective extraction platform, which is an asphaltine granulation and carbon removal process for heavy feedstocks. Okay, that's great. Uh, basically, you develop new technologies, you license them, you install them, and uh, your select product takes the carbon out of the barrel. In, in a nutshell, yes. in, in a in nutshell. A, that's exactly what we do. Exactly, I was going for the nutshell. Okay. Uh, let's start with how a refinery operates, and we've got a barrel of convention, conventional crude, light sweet crude, and if I understand this correctly, and I'm looking at uh, some images that I pulled off a presentation that you provided me, so if we've got a typical barrel, we've got LPG, naphtha, dis distillates, and these are increasingly heavy uh, parts of the, the oil as we go through it. And now at the end, we have, uh, or close to the end, we have VGO and residue. Could you explain what all of those parts of the barrel are, please? Yeah, so as you, so a barrel of oil, regardless of what type of oil it is, is, is a mixture. It's a mixed bag of petroleum constituents. And when we talk about a barrel of light oil versus a light, uh, versus a barrel of heavy oil, what we really mean is that the relative proportions of lighter constituents are more pervasive in lighter barrels. And in heavier uh, barrels of oil, you have higher proportions of heavy constituents, such as residues that are the non-distillable fractions, as well as the asphaltines, uh, which is the focus of our Selects technology. Now, in a refinery, uh, depending on the type of feedstock that is fed to the refinery, uh, it will be configured in a specific way to manage specific types of crude. So refineries that handle lighter crude slates uh, often have more processing capacity to handle lighter uh, fractions of the barrel versus when you deal with the unconventional refinery that manages heavier portions of the barrel, um, you typically deal with more energy intensive uh, processes to manage those portions that are, that are more difficult to, to manage in conventional refining. Right. And then the reason for that is because the heavier parts of the barrel require more energy to, to process. Yes, that, that's correct. Um, and just from a, from a process chemistry standpoint, 
Um, there are different constituents that are incompatible with conventional refining processes. If you look at heavy, ultra heavy crudes, uh, they typically have uh, higher levels of nickel, vanadium, sulfur. Uh, many of these heavy metals and sulfur compounds uh, pose a very real risk to refiners uh, simply because it, can, it may lead to plugging of equipment or poisoning of catalysts that are, that are very expensive. Okay. Now, in again, I'm looking at the barrel of conventional crude. Uh, could you explain what VGO and residue are? Right. So um, residue is the non-distillable fraction uh, of the barrel. So when, when you send any type of crude to a refinery, the first step in, in the process is subjecting that barrel to distillation. So you, uh, you, can, you subject the barrel to uh, atmospheric distillation, you uh, distill off the lighter portions of that barrel, then in more complex refineries, you'll subsequently subject um, the, that non-distillable fraction to a vacuum distillation, which is essentially distillation under vacuum conditions, drawing out more of those constituents that are, are, are fungible. And what, you're, what remains is the residue portion. Uh, vacuum gas oils are, uh, portions of the barrel that are somewhere in between that, uh, that are not necessarily residues, but can be used for the production of, uh, of consumer grade combustion fuels with a little bit more processing. Okay. And uh, looking again at your uh, image here, the, in a typical conventional crude, the amount of residue is, is fairly small. Yes, it can, and, be, it can be minuscule in some cases. Right. And the VGO, uh, would be maybe a third, let's say, typically. Right. right. Okay. And the rest, then the, the other two thirds, uh, distillates, naphtha, and LPG are the uh, much lighter parts of that the barrel, and so they make up about two thirds. Well, let's right. now some talk. Of the, some of the ultra light portions of the barrel um, can be used directly as, say, like a gasoline or diesel feedstock, but those VGOs typically need to undergo some type of processing, such as you know. Uh, fluid catalytic cracking, which is the workhorse of any, any refinery, cracking those bigger molecules into smaller molecules like gasoline and diesel constituents. Okay, now let's talk about, uh, about bitumen. So in a barrel of bitumen, you've got a small portion of LGO, uh, a much bigger portion of HGO, makes up about half, roughly half the barrel. Then you've got asphaltines free residue, but then you've got a very large percentage of asphaltines. So what's L, uh, LGO, HGO, and the residue? Um, so in a nutshell, the LGO and HGO um, are the distillable fractions that you can extract from the barrel using distillation or vacuum distillation, and the residue is what remains. Now, when we look at the residue, uh, there, there's actually quite a bit of that, that uh, that barrel that can still be used to turn into good consumer grade fuels. But when you look at the asphaltine portion, that is really the portion that we focus on that we view as not appropriate for turning into combustion fuels, simply because it takes so much energy to, to transform. Um, you have to crack them, you have to subject them to catalytic processes, you have to remove large volumes of, of sulfur and heavy metal contaminants. What is what is uh, what are asphaltines made of? What are what are they com uh, composed of? Well, that's a that's that's kind of a loaded question. Um, asphaltines are are they're they're typically polycyclic, uh, highly aromatic compounds within bitumen um, that that uh, lead to reduced flow properties and reduced processability. All of these are technically petroleum constituents, but some constituents such as these asphaltines are harder to process. So when I think of asphaltines, the first thing that pops into my head is asphalt, the stuff right. we put down to make, make roads of. And that suggests that the asphaltines are very, very thick. And that, that's that correct. Ash, asphaltines are primarily carbon. Uh, one of the conventional ways to utilize asphaltines is to take them out of a refinery and use them for asphalt. Uh, but there is only a limited market for that. And the conventional ways of using asphaltines are conversion into petroleum coke, uh, which is then used as a solid fuel substitute for say coal-fired plants. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the market outlook for that end use is diminishing simply due to the carbon emissions associated with the burning of that material. 
Right. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind uh, on this topic is uh, Suncor Energy uh, is used to use some of its uh, pet coke uh, to fire its boilers right. uh, in North. And now they're phasing that out. They're going to go to cogeneration uh, using natural gas because the pet coke was so emissions intensive. So, right. Exactly. And uh, there are a number of different processes on the market for managing the bottom of the barrel, which I would call a conventional bottom of the barrel processes, such as coking, delayed coking, or ebulated bed hydrocracking. When you look at delayed coking, you actually burn about a third of the coke that you produce uh, simply to power the energy re required to run the process. So uh, these are by and large, very emissions intensive processes. Gotcha. And on average, uh, how much of the barrel of bitumen do asphaltines comprise? Asphaltines comprise about 15 to 20% of the barrel of bitumen. Uh, when we look at empirical correlations as to how does that translate into coke production, um, the number is about 1.6 times the CCR content uh, or the Conradson carbon residue content uh, within a barrel, uh, which translates into about 30% of uh, coke forming propensity from bitumen. However, if we can remove those asphaltines before we turn them into coke, I think there's a very strong case there. Okay, so let's now talk about, we, we've we determined that uh, the, uh, the barrel of bitumen has somewhere in around 20 to 30% that of uh, very heavy uh, material that doesn't lend itself well to turning into fuels. And, that correct? Okay. And your process takes that material out of the barrel early in the extraction process. Uh, can you please describe how it works? Sure. So the feedstock to our process is the residue. And as we discussed previously, the residue is the non-distillable fraction of the barrel. Uh, once that feed enters our process, uh, our process is a uh, supercritical solvent extraction technology, which is analogous to the decaffeination process. We use a light, readily available solvent at supercritical conditions. And what we're able to do is manipulate both the solvent and anti-solvent characteristics of the system while operating in a multi-phase, uh, multi-component phase equilibria. Ultimately, this increases the turbulent mixing in the petroleum feedstock and solvent, enhances mass transfer, and also promotes asphalt phase separation. Now, that's for, for the listeners, that's a lot of technical <laughs> jargon. Uh, so right. to distill this down into something very simple, what we do is we produce a high yield of what we call clean decarbonized oil, or you can call it deasphalted oil that is suitable for conventional refinery processing. And then we also remove a natural granular carbon material that is dry and easy to handle. Okay, well, I really appreciate the non-engineer explanation for this because uh, yeah, that's the one I can understand. Okay, so you remove the, the, the bottom of the barrel, you got that carbon removed. Does that make, that, that sounds to me an awful lot like an upgrader. In a sense, yes. Um, the, the intent of an upgrader is to transform a barrel of, of bitumen that is incompatible with uh, uh, as, a, as a standalone to, for transport in uh, through pipeline infrastructure and in a sense upgrade the flow characteristics of that barrel. Um, this is achieved typically through thermal or catalytic processes which are typically uh, energy intensive and very costly. Uh, and what we've developed is a simpler way of achieving the same goal um, simply by removing those most problematic components. Now, upgraders and, uh, and, and refineries, uh, they typically reject uh, that heavy portion of the barrel, uh, transforming it into as much um, you know, readily available liquid combustion fuel as possible. But in our view, when we look at the, the energy mechanisms required, and in, especially in context of a low carbon economy, our view is that we should just be removing those compounds early in the value chain. And if I understand this correctly, the cost for your process is about two dollars and dollar fifty to two dollars a barrel. Is that correct? Based on based on empirical data from existing operators over in Asia. Now, the caveat I will give is this is highly dependent on location, based on the cost of labor, the cost of energy inputs. Right. 
But, you know, I've seen estimates for what it costs to uh, partially upgrade bitumen so that you can, and, and just for our readers, a little background, uh, to, to move bitumen, it's kind of like the consistency of peanut butter. If you want to put it in a pipeline, you have to dilute it with a lighter hydrocarbon. And uh, typically the, the mix is 30% uh, 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 diluent. Uh, to 70% bitumen. Well, at the 30% of that pipeline then is essentially, uh, you're not getting any value out of it. And so the, the proposal was made three, four years ago, there was actually an Alberta government program designed to promote partial upgrading technologies to turn bitumen into a medium uh, crude or a heavy duty crude that would flow in the pipeline without any diluents. You, it's like freeing up 30% of your, of your pipeline. And that's essentially what your your process does, right, Warren? Yes, that's exactly what it does. Uh, as previously mentioned, we remove those most problematic components within the barrel of bitumen, leaving the rest, the rest of the barrel to be sent as uh, good feedstock to refineries, um, to consumer markets. Now, when we look at other partial upgrading technologies within the sector, uh, many of these ones are similar to upgraders in a sense that they employ some type of thermal cracking or mild thermal cracking or vis breaking process, um, all relying on changing the molecules within the crude to increase the flow properties. Um, our solution is different. We're saying remove those problematic components completely and free up more of the pipeline capacity for that good crude that you wanna send that can fetch a better price at the market. Exactly right. Okay. so. But there's another part of this equation now that is getting paid a lot more attention, and that is taking what you've removed from the oil, from the heavy oil, from the bitumen, and turning it in, turning that carbon into products. Right. And uh, I, I've interviewed now a number of, uh, of scientists and, and analysts on this, and we, we see everything, you know, uh, CO2 and carbon being turned into, into uh, materials for clothing, into all sorts of, you know, carbon, uh, I mentioned that earlier, the carbon fiber is a huge opportunity around bitumen, uh, asphalt binder. I mean, the carbon now we used to be a, a waste product is now being considered as a feedstock for other, uh, other applications. Have I got it correct? Yes, and that, that is the basis of what we call a circular economy, taking a traditional waste stream from one sector and using it for the benefit of another while adding value. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we can make carbon fiber, we can make asphalt binders. Uh, we're also at well uh, looking at other ways to utilize this resource, uh, such as waterproofing materials, uh, filtration media for say water treatment, um, as well as gas transfer applications for the aquaculture industry. Is it possible to develop markets to use 100% of the material that could be removed from the 2 million barrels of non-upgraded bitumen, basically raw bitumen, that's exported to the, uh, to the US every day? Well, that's what we're working hard at at Well Resources right now to establish um, that market intelligence and uh, gauge the market's ability to intake large quantities of this carbon material. Um, our existing operations are predominantly in Asia, and we've actually partnered with a number of institutions and private companies over on that side of the world to develop some of these products. Some of these products are already commercial, and we're simply looking at the feasibility of introducing them within the Canadian market. Um, interestingly, the waterproofing material, uh, waterproofing cement additive um, that is used uh, in, in Taiwan uh, uses uh, the solid asphaltines from our process. Well, so you doing you're doing this on a fairly small basis right now. I think uh, you had a pl one plant that's twenty five thousand barrels a day, and a few 20, others that, twenty thousand. And you've got a few. You've got these others that are maybe five thousand, ten thousand in that range. They're they're smaller, right. smaller plants. So my question is, uh, what has prevented this technology from scaling up uh, to? I mean, much bigger and much faster than it currently is. Well, I think, uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the market's appetite for um, absorbing this type of material is one thing that definitely needs to be unlocked, particularly in North America, uh, especially as we're looking at changing the way um, the uh, business is currently conducted in terms of utilizing the resource. Uh, another one is, is simply timing. Uh, 
um, in, in 2014, 2015, the Canadian oil patch hit a rough, uh, hit a rough rut due to uh, falling oil prices, uh, forcing many companies locally to protect their balance sheets and move away from these capital intensive uh, projects. Um, and I think historically uh, within Alberta, uh, many of our stakeholders have been burned from uh, public uh, public money is being put into these mega projects. So there is a sense of caution when it comes to implementing these new types of technologies that can transform the sector. That's not to say that it's not possible. It's just to say that we have to be smart about what we're really doing and uh, truly understand the risks and the value that can be added uh, through changing our product slates. You know, that's a fair comment and I get it. And I hear it all the time in the, in the Alberta oil patch. Uh, you know, the, the uh, oil and gas industry uh, globally is very, very innovative. And there's all kinds of products that, come, that have come to, to market over the years and over the decades that failed. You know, that's, I mean, that's common. And it's one, one of the reasons why oil and gas engineers are as risk averse as they are, because they've seen, if, they're, if they've been around for a while, they've seen various gadgets and equipment uh, be introduced to great fanfare and then fail out in the field. So I, I, I get that. By the same token, the, 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 it's not uncommon in the development of uh, new technologies, you know, they follow the S-curve and they spend a lot of time at the beginning of the S-curve, sometimes decades before the circumstances are right, the market conditions are right, the policy conditions are right. All of those things, all of that time, the technology has to be, has to evolve and develop to the point where it's, you know, it's economic and it's, it's efficient and so on. But it seems the feeling I get here, Warren, is that, you know, despite perhaps previous failures and related technologies, uh, the technology now is in the right place. The policy and market conditions are in the right place. And now we stand at a time when this is an opportunity that needs to be seized. Absolutely. This is this is a major opportunity that can be seized, especially here in Alberta, especially considering uh, we have pipeline egress issues and we, we don't get a fair deal for our for our petroleum. Um, when when we take a look at that S curve that you mentioned, uh, that's something that we've been able to develop and get across the finish line over in Asia with our with our um, Asian uh, customers. And, uh, you know, to, to an extent that that is due to the fact that their market condition requires uh, them to import price advantage crudes sim simply because there's so much need for energy over there, so much need for cheap energy. So in one sense, if you're able to import cheap energy into Asia and clean it up at a very low cost, that's a win for Asia. Uh, but in the same regard, when we look at Canada, the application here is on the flip side. Uh, we want to retain more of the value here at home while improving our infrastructure. And I think that's a huge opportunity. Well, I'm going to have to let you go. But before I do, one last point, and that is the number of things that can be made. So I'm, again, I'm looking at one of the, the graphics that came out of your presentation. And the carbon materials that you're re, uh, are removing can be made into food, can be made into uh uh, aquaculture and aquaponics as a filter material, I take it. Uh, it can be made into nanotubes. It can be made into, uh, somebody told me that uh, uh, nanotube, carbon-based, uh, nanotubes made from, from CO2 and carbon can now are made, uh, make uh, Lululemon uh, uh, clothing. So, so, so to use this material to its best advantage, I guess is where I'm going with my argument, is it, we need to think beyond the typical Canadian hewers of wood and drawers of water. We need to think about what, how do we make, build consumer, uh, make consumer uh, products. And that's not something that Alberta is great at. It's not something that Canada is great at. And it seems to me that that's an, a, an impediment uh, not, they don't have supply chains, don't have the, the, the policy frameworks, all of, you know, we don't have the existing clusters of those kinds of industries. Do you think we can get over that? I think we can. I think it's going to take a lot of cooperation between multiple different industries, bringing in different perspectives and expertise. Uh, we are at a point where we have the technology to produce the carbon. And as you rightly 
ask the question, what do we do with that? And what are the different uh, expertise that we need to turn that carbon into something that's valuable? Um, so uh, at Well Resources, we are an open book. Uh, we welcome collaboration with cross-disciplinary stakeholders. And um, just last week, we mentioned we announced a partnership with a local Canadian company called Benchmark, uh, who supplies gas transfer equipment for the aquaculture industry. So we're looking at ways that we can use that carbon, particularly as a filtration media to enhance their operations, to add value to their customers. But there's so many product lines out there um, that can be envisioned. It's just a matter of bringing the right stakeholders together and uh, getting something done. Warren, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.